Hello and welcome to There's Suffin About Suffolk, a podcast where we deep dive into the county of Suffolk. To kick off episode one, we're focusing on film with the 2021 release, The Dig. In part one, I review the film with guests John Wright, Anne Hurst, Laura Bacon and Mavis the Fox. I talk to Laura Howarth, Archaeology and Engagement Manager at Sutton Hoo about the changes made for the film and hear stories from the set from Ray Fine's personal assistant, Jay Ducker. Stay tuned at the end of this and every episode for some original music to accompany the episode's theme. This week we have a traditional Suffolk folk song by Charlie Haylock and Jay Ducker on set of The Dig. Although it never made it into the final film, you can hear part of it here today. What are they? We're standing in someone's graveyard, I reckon. Viking? Oh, maybe older. Mr. Brown is an archaeologist. Well, I'm an excavator. You've come to dig up the mounds. So you think there's something beneath? Based on the 2007 novel by John Preston, The Dig was released to Netflix on the 29th of January 2021 and currently has 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. Starring Rafe Fiennes as local excavator and archaeologist Basil Brown and Carey Mulligan as Edith Pretty, The Dig follows a semi-fictionalised account of the discoveries made at Sutton Hoo in 1939. My guests today have been delicately uncovered using the finest brushes and are as sparkly and valuable as the Sutton who treasures themselves. From BBC Radio Suffolk, you can hear him Mondays and Tuesdays from 6pm. It's John Wright. Good evening. From the stage, the sound booth, the page and the puppeteering studio, it's the multi-talented Laura Bacon. Hi. Joining Laura, hopefully not too past her bedtime, is the sensational Suffolk Fox, Mavis. Hello, dears. And last but incapable of being leased from the fringes of my Twitter feed to the Norwich Fringe Festival, it's the hilarious Anne Hurst, a.k.a. the terrified writer. Hello. Thank you all so much for joining me. We are gathered here today, of course, to talk about Netflix's The Dig, not only filmed in Suffolk, but entirely based on, in, about, under, through, it's about Suffolk, as about as Suffolk as you can get. It's very Suffolk. And the IMDb breakdown is an archaeologist embarks on the historically important excavation of Sutton Hoo in 1938. It stars Ray Fiennes as the archaeologist in question, Basil Brown, and Kerry Mulligan as the woman who, let's be honest, started it all, Edith Pretty. So I'm going to jump us straight in here and ask what you all thought of the casting of Kerry Mulligan. She's significantly younger than Edith Pretty was, wasn't she? Significantly. And it's frustrating because I feel she does a very good job and the chemistry between her and Ray Fiennes is genuine and their acting styles really complement each other. But it's so distracting. And the minute you realise how young she is, you think she's like doing a GCSE, you know, <laughs> like 16 trying to do a bit of Pinter. And you're just like, oh, Carrie, like, come on, man. It's very difficult for casting agents and people, though, because um, women, when they hit 35, they just disappear, don't they? Where are you going to find actresses we or do. actors? Of, of that age i mean it's just impossible it's, so yeah it's very true they i think they just sort of a hole appears in the ground <laughs> and they all fall through it so someone's just gonna have to start digging to find some actresses who could actually play appropriate ages sorry am what were you gonna say well i was just gonna say that carrie is probably one of those people who can play that sort of role because she's got that quite i, I want to say quite an old-fashioned looking face classic and, yeah but it's that sort of of that era she's very of that era mm. um i mean that in the most uh, flattering way um but yeah she's i mean i just adore her and i thought she i thought i did i wasn't distracted by the by the age thing with her i just thought she was quite a presence right from the off was that a red herring though like was that a red herring to make us think oh is something gonna happen with them with the chemistry but then 
when his wife appeared, it was like, oh, no, 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 I want to be the... He can't be unfaithful. And of course he wasn't unfaithful. And I think that was just to tease us a little bit, to give a bit of Hollywood to it. I'm not sure. Absolutely. I completely agree. I was I was starting to get on the verge of being incredibly disappointed when she was, like, like doing this sort of smirky, like, oh, oh would, you, would you like to come to dinner? And he was, like, looking across the mounds, like, what, what? Well, yes, that would be lovely. And then she was like putting her nice fancy earrings in and she looked particularly nice that evening. Yeah. And then they were like, no, Monica Dolan's here now. And I was like, good. Mm. But um, yeah, so luck, like I'm thankful that, and they sort of never refer to it again, which is a little bit silly for putting it in in the first place. And whether they were just doing that, as you kind of said, to make a point of her youth. I feel like they just they had sh- to do that just because Hollywood. It was like, well, like they had a checklist, and like actually we haven't <laughs> received any romance, and they're like, oh, yeah. well, well, should we throw in something at the end? Let's get an army guy and a young girl who's got a gay husband, and it's just like, <laughs> oh my god, like throw that in there. <laughs> so Lily James plays um, Peggy Piggott, and she is married to Mister Piggott, uh, who I did not Google because he was not as interesting as her. And she, yeah, they did divorce in real life, those two characters. But a long time after the dig, the um, character that she falls in love with is is entirely fictional. And it really is, isn't it? It's just the last sort of 10 minutes tacked on the end yeah. for mm. a Hollywood producer watching the movie going, hang on a minute. There's, there's no, no like, sex. Sex. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Put some sex in that and it'll make, it, make it exciting. Because no That'd one wants to watch a film about digging. I do. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I think often um, you, you see a trailer for a film and you think that they've only written the lines so that they can go in the trailer. So him saying, you, you say it and I'll dig. And then, will you have dinner with me? Oh, yes, I will. And all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously they're not Cornish pirates. Um, but <laughs> but that, that's kind of all it comes to nothing, doesn't it? That's not... If you watch the trailer, you would assume that, that the, the kind of Stevie sub plot of, of them will they won't they is pivotal to the story and it's it's utterly irrelevant really isn't it and it's just there just for those little sound bites in the in the first 30 second trailer so it's a bit disappointing it's a bit like in if you watch rogue one the star wars um extra story there's a lovely line in the trailer saying this is this is a rebellion i rebel and and that's not even in the film it's obviously just made just so they can have something pithy to say in the trailer so um yeah. i i very much like the film but it, it it lost points from me for for that mm-hmm. oh that's right there was a few misleading things actually in the trailer i felt one of them was that was when rafe was was uh, buried in the soil and then somebody in the trailer mentions so, well you know everybody dies or something like that and I remember thinking so when he did get buried I thought well he can't die because he's in it all the way and then again he's got, that he's was got just digging not to do, he? he's got, <laughs> surely um but yeah so I did think as well that the trailer did leave some I can't bear it when they do that they give you all their best bits and you're expecting this and then yeah. what's what the delivery is is something different so yeah it's funny i have a a standard rule that i go by where if it's a good trailer it will be a bad film and if it's a bad trailer it will be a good film and i remember watching the trailer of the dig a few months before it came out and i was like ugh, they're gonna try and modernize it they're gonna put a stupid romance in it she is playing a woman that is way older than she should be and then of course the movie is very much more respectful than the trailer looks like it's going to be it's it's a better story than the trailer gives you're right again it's like the hollywood man was like get the people watching the movie about the digging and people were like no one's gonna watch a movie about digging because i believe it was in production for a while with people literally being like get out of here digging no (laughs) I have a theory, a similar thing. I believe that if you watch a movie for the first 10 minutes, it's those first 10 minutes that will make or break a movie. So if you're not engaged in those first 10 minutes, that's it. Like, you it, it, you that know, movie. you just know from those first 10 minutes. Yeah, I think but that's valid. I was enthralled by the, the first moment he said his first line just because of the Suffolk thing. So even for the trailer, I was like, He's doing it right. He's he's got the accent. This is insane. Like I've heard, like people try and do Suffolk in films, and they're always pirates or hobbits or 
Not quite. <laughs> a little In, bit indeed. Norfolk. Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> but, like, he absolutely nailed it. And I can't even remember what the first line was, but I was like, <gasps> and I felt emotional. And um, He's so talk, talking on the boat, emotional. isn't he? He's it's saying there's a, there's a dig on. And off he goes. Yeah. He's digging. So I, I watched it with um, three of my <laughs> children. Possibly four of my children. All of my children. Small one didn't pay attention. She's three. That was understandable. But we've been to Sutton Hoo. And um, they've done Anglo-Saxons. And they've seen the mask and, and the helmet and all that kind of stuff. So I thought it would um, be a good thing for their education to, to <laughs> sit and watch it. Um, and there was no, <laughs> no Anglo-Saxons in it. They didn't even see the mask or refer to the helmet or anything like that and yeah. um yeah and there was lots and lots of of you know nice scenic shots and and people eyeing each other up in a pub and um <laughs> my my children bless them sat pretty much all the way through it but I, c I could tell they were looking at me going why the hell is he making us watch this <laughs> why do you hate <laughs> us <laughs> now i must say i went on the imdbs and i found out that weren't filmed in suffolk entirely so that was filmed in surrey Mm -hmm. This is true, I yeah. Ooh, and that fact. disappointed me, yeah. And was that really this? So I don't know if that was this or not. There was a sign in the there scene. There was a that sign for this, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. I should like to know every scene and what. Well, I like the pub scene. Was that a real pub in Safford? I don't Who know. Knows? I don't That's think That's probably so. inside a warehouse somewhere. I mean, obviously, they, they couldn't go and dig at Sutton Hoo because it's a, a valuable archaeological site. So, But it did look very. Um, the, you could make a mound. Look... Yeah, you could make a mound in Southwold or somewhere else, couldn't you? Yeah. I still have that in Suffolk. Yeah. Well, I believed yeah. it until I saw the credits. Yeah. All, all the all the cycling along the roads and the um, the boat on the Deben and everything that was all that was all Suffolk. That looked lovely. I have right, a logistical yeah, question be. though. Are we yeah. are we re are we expected to believe that the little boy cycled from Sutton Hoo to Dis? Right. <laughs> I, I wondered about Poor that. Yeah, he, he was quite tired, wasn't he? But so, um, so that's one real concern, and he shouldn't have done that. And secondly, did you notice when he was on his bike, just on his way to Dis from Sutton Hoo, um, that lorry that went past him really did get very, very close? I don't know if anyone right, noticed that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I thought did it was going to be knocked down, poor little old boy. I did. Yeah, I did. did. Yeah. Poor little old sausage. I was actually thinking actor's insurance. <laughs> well, I hope he's with equity. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. He, I'm sure he will be. I honestly sure did. Will well, I, I, I shall just say one thing before my arm fall off. I would like to say I am ever so pleased to hear the Suffolk accent back. Well, it's never been in a film before. I say back because it's starting. We might start something new. Yeah. You know. Now, people. I saw on on the Twitters that. Netflix UK had actually twat saying, I love the Suffolk accent, BRB, that means be right back, moving to Ipswich. And I couldn't believe it. Okay. I saw that. People were very excited about that. They didn't show the helmet on the film. I thought that was ever so strange. I thought the I same, Mavis, that. and it's because, of course, the helmet was in pieces and covered in rust and they had to take it to the lab. Oh. Scene where Lily James's husband goes to the lab, the pieces that he's holding, I'm assuming, are the helmet because that's where it was all put together. But I expected a big reveal where Lily James sort of pulled the helmet out of the soil in full yeah. sort of gold, but it, it never came. Well, they could have showed it at the end when they recap and tell you what happened and then he went on to do this and she went on to do that and then there was a helmet. Yeah. And the helmet is the most important thing, isn't it? This no, is true. go and see that. Bye, Dees. Wait. Bye, Mavis. <laughs> Bye, Mavis. When, <laughs> when they went off to the lab, though, they probably didn't do very much um, restoration. That was the implication, wasn't it? Yes, I think they were off oh. to sort of canoodle, as it were. Yes. Um, which was an interesting addition, I think. Um, I wonder if it was invented, because I'm not sure if it was invented or if it is based in fact. But um, I wonder if they did that to make both sides more sympathetic. So no one was really the villain in this piece, would you argue? Or were you like, damn the British Museum? Um, mm. Well, the, the British Museum are, are, the, are the baddies in it. And we had a nice bit of kind of class structure interplay. And it was, um, it was interesting, you know, so obviously Edith Pretty had status from her money, but she was still just a woman, wasn't she? So they were all very much of, of the mind that she should do what she was told with it all. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and so that that side of thing was was interesting i i thought it was just an unnecessary distraction and it 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 made um uh mrs piggott what was her name peggy peggy, peggy. piggott <coughs> I, I think it's a fantastic name Great it is a fantastic name, name but it, it probably lessened her um her contribution to it all i think she was you know it was all very um kind of suggested that she was there just on the coattails of her husband and all that kind of stuff and i think mm -hmm. she was probably um actually there on her own merits uh, a bit more than that so there was that was a bit disappointing more so than her husband from what i understood she was by that point already a, a fully established archaeologist had lots of digging around in the dirt behind her and yet she turns up here and they're like ha ha casual sexism get in the ground lily james and she's like oh i don't know how to dig in the dirt mm. and then she's like mm. i found something it's like oh come on peggy You're and then like, like <laughs> hotel scene i'm just gonna come out with a shower naked and have a towel because hollywood <laughs> literally like quick we've got lily james make her wear no clothes in at least one scene make her like, naked in her contract Quite i did wonder actually because at the beginning of netflix it says sexual references and like sex scenes like no <laughs> in a suffolk <laughs> film dick. in the digger no <laughs> But yeah, and she gets a full-on little sex scene behind that broken down wall at the end as well. Thrown so. in right at the end, just because. <laughs> sex scene! Mm. There was actually a, a technique that I wanted to point out that I hadn't seen in many films where there were lots of scenes where they were talking for a very long time when they were it was like a previous speech, but then they just showed, I don't know what you call that. I should know yeah, this. Yeah, it's right. like, yeah, they were sort of they did. staring at each other with their mouths shut mm. and then it was a voiceover of a either a previous conversation or like they were telepathic from almost. minutes before yeah and yeah. it wasn't just i know you do that in a little bit in a film or like if, if there's an establishing shot but then that went on for a very long time it was most of the film and it was yeah. almost <laughs> like like this is a new technique that this particular um director is going to use it's like he's discovered it and he's like oh we should use this like all the time I quite liked yeah. it it was quite theatrical in that it was sense. very theatrical and i thought it really set a tone for the piece um, just to quickly go back to Lily and Carrie, this film mm. does pass the Bechdel test, from what I understood. Um, are you all aware of the Bechdel test? Yes, but remind us. A test in a movie where you need two female characters who are named, they need to talk to each other about something other than a man. Um, next time you watch a movie, see if it passes that test, you will be very <coughs> surprised. Uh, but this one does, Carrie and Lily, sorry, Edith and... Peggy do have lots of conversations about thing about her health about the dig um they do also talk about the men and the sun but they th there are enough conversations that it does pass that test which I thought was quite surprising considering there were only two women in the piece um so I'm glad that it, it feels like someone really went out of their way to ensure that and I'm really glad that they did because it but easily they... could have been just men digging in the ground but then they threw in the sex at the end just, just <laughs> to compensate and yeah. they also yeah. they also wrote out uh, another um women's contribution because the photographers were uh, um uh, a couple of school teachers who were on holiday and they came along they took all the photographs so to have the the dashy cousin invented to um to replace them is 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 again taking out out their contribution because they you know they they took color f um film and some cine film which is all really really valuable and was you know would have been very expensive um at the time so for th their contribution to our understanding of, of and the, documenting that process is is a shame i don't see why they couldn't have put that in i mean they could have then gone off and had sex in the bunker or whatever by the river if if that's well, a, a requirement yeah, yeah. Like, well, great. Yeah. they've denied us of an lgbtq plus representation there as well lily james could have fallen in love with a nice young hot female teacher who was taking the photographs what's wrong mm. with that well, that's an maybe she did yeah, you think oh extra girl characters that would be great yeah Literally. i mean if you're talking if you're talking about equality and representation the, the the heterosexual couple get to have sex um, on camera and the, the gay couple get to have a, a wink and a nudge and then off down a corridor to a, um, no. so it's all implied and, and stuff. So yeah, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, you may as well do it properly is yeah. my mm. advice. And me and George Michael agree on that. So I'm here now 
now with Laura from Sutton Who, which makes you sound very old and very grand. You're not actually an Anglo-Saxon. Um, what is your job at Sutton Who? Yep, um, so I'm the Archaeology and Engagement Manager at National Trust Sutton Who. Nice. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, so just like a bit of what is what is Sutton Who? <laughs> yep. Um, so Sutton Who, um, we refer to as... Um, it's kind of one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. Now that's that's a pretty bold statement to make, but it does it does live up to the reputation. So it's an Anglo-Saxon burial site, so uh, a royal burial ground, and um, just to kind of locate people. So we're on the kind of the River Deben across from Woodbridge in Suffolk. Um, so it's a seventh century Anglo-Saxon royal burial site, um, and then there's kind of lots of different. Um, phases to Sutton Hoo's history, you know, landscapes are layered, um, but principally what people will know if they know anything about Sutton Hoo will be uh, a discovery that was made in 1939 um, that kind of truly revolutionised our understanding of who these people were, uh, a period that was seen as the Dark Ages were suddenly illuminated and from this burial came some remarkable um, objects such as the Sutton Hoo helmet, which is world famous. So, um, yeah, if you know anything about Sutton Hoo, that's probably what you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, it's recently become even more famous through the Netflix movie of The Dig. Um, so how soon was Sutton Hoo sort of told that there was going to be a movie made? Um, I think there's always been... Um... So there's there's a book called The Dig, which the film is um, based on, and it's all inspired by events that happened at Sutton Hoo. So I think important to say it's not kind of a documentary as such, but it's um, inspired by real events and real people. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, so there's a book um, written by John Preston called The Dig, and I think there's always been kind of conversations or rumours that there was going to be a film uh, for many years now, and um, kind of yeah we weren't really sure you know what was happening with that and thought oh it'll be amazing if it does happen and then um it kind of gathered pace you know quite quickly and um members of the cast and crew came to the site to do their research um and I think get a feeling of kind of the story and the site and its significance there um and then a couple of us um myself included were very fortunate enough to actually be invited to the film set so that was um a very surreal yet amazing opportunity because um what they found in 1939 was the fossil of a ship so we have very acidic soil here in Suffolk which meant that a lot of the organic material in this uh, royal Anglo-Saxon ship burial that they discovered had rotted away over time it created this acid bath so when you look at those amazing photos you're not actually seeing the timber of a ship you're seeing the fossil mm -hmm. and that's something that you can't see when you visit Sutton Hoo today that that no longer exists we have a very nice uh full-scale sculptural representation of the ship but you can't see the ship itself so to actually go to the film set and see what it would have been like in 1939 yeah. was just a very weird yet amazing um opportunity it was like we kind of stumbled into one of the photographs in our collection yeah. um and it kind of walking past people and being like oh, i know who that is by the way that they're dressed a lot of the characters um are synonymous with kind of certain bits of their kind of um kind of costume so basil brown for example you know local um pride for him i think as well has really come out for the film uh, with his flat cap and his pipe and those kind of things and it was just kind of like oh yes that must be so and so and that must be <laughs> so yeah, it was a great opportunity <laughs> yeah that's so cool um so to just d dive straight into the sort of characters of the film because one thing i asked you to sort of research for me was the difference because I always find it interesting and you're absolutely right this is a fictionalized account of a historical event essentially and so of course certain artistic liberties will have been taken but I'd really love to see just how artistic the liberties were if that makes sense. Yeah so with the the film obviously some creative license has been used and it's based on the book um I mean I won't go through all the differences but just to give you a flavor of some of the ways in which the film deviates from Kind of the true story and we are hoping that the film will encourage people to come and visit National Trust Sutton Hoo as and when restrictions are lifted mm -hmm. so people can discover more about the true story but we have got 
a really interesting article on our website that's digging the dirt so the kind of the true story behind the film so anyone who's watched it and thinks did that really happen was it like that I encourage you to have a look at that but I'll just go through a couple of examples so Rory Lomax who is played by Johnny Flynn in the film um, he is a fictional character and he is uh, Edith Pretty's cousin I think in the film mm -hmm. um, and he kind of takes on board the role of the kind of the site photographer in the film um, and in actual fact lots of different people took photographs uh, during the excavation. Basil took some photographs, um, other people that came as well um, but one, uh, well, two of the photographers that I'd really like to highlight are Mercy Lack and Barbara Wagstaff. And they um, arrived at Sutton Heath after the treasures had been removed. But what they did was help document the fossil of the ship. And this is a time that I don't think is really represented in the film so much, but it's when the Science Museum come and survey the ship after all the treasures have been removed. And that's roughly the time frame when they're on site. And between them, they took about 60% of the contemporary negative record of the dig. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their contribution is huge. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the plans of the ship went up in flames during the Blitz. Um, so their photographs, and these are recorded in meticulous detail of the ship. Um, they, it's really kind of important, not only from kind of a social history point of view, but the technical kind of archaeological record as well. Um, so they were both school teachers and saying amateur photographers is it's always a bit of a difficult word to use. They they were really kind of uh, knew their stuff and they both went on to become associates of the Royal Photographic Society. Wow. We think that their um, the photographs that they took at Sutton who might have formed part of their portfolio for that. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very fortunate enough to have um, a set of their photographs at Sutton Hill in our archive, which were donated by Mercy Lack's uh, great nephew, Andrew Lack. And we are just going through a project at the moment to conserve and digitise those photographs so they can be more readily shared. But Mercy Lack's albums in particular, I mean, you've got these amazing images in themselves. And then she's gone round either typewritten or handwritten these wonderful notes about who the people are, what ribs of the ship we're looking at, sometimes what time of day it is. Um, and yeah, so that's, I think, one of the differences is that they've kind of, I guess, created a character that serves um, in another way, but there were these amazing other people um, mm -hmm. that were involved in the ship. So um, I think, yeah, that's one of the points that um, I think the film will hopefully inspire people to discover more about the real people that are involved and the real story as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a shame that they had the opportunity to put in two more women characters and they instead opted for a young romantic semi-lead instead. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, there's such amazing uh, women and um, we also have in our collection, Mercy Lack started to write a book about her experiences um, and it wasn't published and she she didn't get beyond writing kind of a full draft she got a couple of chapters in but just to hear her own voice about the ghosts of the ship how lucky they were um, and yeah it is it, a shame but I think um, hopefully this kind of project that we've had this internally funded project to conserve and digitize the photographs when people can come back to Sutton Who, they can see these photographs uh, displayed um, we've got them kind of on a rotating display uh, uh, in our dining room uh, there so hopefully yeah it'll encourage people to discover a bit more about um, the true story which is such mm -hmm. a rich story in itself I mean yeah. there's kind of social history, personal relationships, the backdrop of the beginning of World War II. So I guess, you know, um, in a way it was trying to um, think about, yeah, like with any story and I guess with any film, you can't put it all in. So mm -hmm. I guess it was choosing which bits they wanted to pull out and which bits they could yeah. fit in, I guess. Of course. I would also like to look at Lily James's character because she she was so interesting to me because she was sort of the first one I went and googled straight away and was quite not even surprised just very almost disappointed to find how incredibly experienced and um, knowledgeable and good at her field she was compared to the sort of almost ditzy Lily James who's sort of there going oh no it you know 
I'm so light, I can do some digging. How do how does one dig? I, oh, oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it um yeah, so for people that watch watch the films, it's um Peggy Piggott. Um and she well, she was known as Peggy Piggott at the time. Um she so this is when she's um married to Stuart Piggott, who's also one of the archaeologists. And I think, yeah, um she was the only female archaeologist involved with the dig, but she was, as you said, very experienced in her own right. Um, and she she wasn't there because she was married to one of the other archaeologists. She was in her own entity, very well qualified and um, kind of selected in her own right. I mean, she um, so she'd studied at Cambridge and at University College London. By this time, she directed her own dig. She published several academic papers. Uh, her career in the end spanned about 60 years. Um, she um, was recognized for her field methods, her research. She was particularly kind of interested in the prehistoric as well, uh, period, uh, settlements, burial traditions. Um, she became a bit of an expert in glass beads as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she, um, later on, I think another thing to say is that her relationship with Stuart, um, they did get divorced uh, many years after the dig, but remained kind of um, on good terms, I guess, because from the late 1980s onwards, Peggy was president of the Wiltshire Archaeological and Natural History Society with Stuart as well. Aww. So there was kind of, you know, they did remain in touch and on good terms as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and she um, she had some great experiences um, excavating with uh, Mortimer Wheeler, who's a bit of a kind of legend, I guess, in the kind of archaeological kind of circles. Um, and she, um, yeah, she she was really amazing and it's great to see her in the photos of the dig from from the actual dig that she was there in her boiler suit you know and she was just kind of um I think she kind of got it um yeah it's kind of like a practical piece of you know mm -hmm. she was just kind of one of the group it wasn't yeah. kind of like she was the the token female archaeologist she was there because she deserved to be there mm -hmm. and the skill that she brought to the excavation absolutely yeah, rather than her little short shorts and crop tops, <laughs> having to borrow <laughs> Carrie Mulligan's trousers. Yeah. Um, I This is quite interesting as well. I, I've said this many times about this movie. I, I sillily, if that's a word, waited the whole movie for the helmet to sort of be brought out of the ground, as I'm sure many did. And I've seen lots of Facebook and Twitter comments of people being like, well, where was the helmet? So could you explain to us why we didn't see the helmet come out the ground? Yeah. Um, so, um, the archaeologist in 1939, so it was, I think it was about a 17 day period, and during that 17 days they lifted 263 objects, so we're talking <laughs> quite a fast pace when it, once it got going, um, so also I would like to say, just going back to Peggy, they did get it spot on though that she was the one that found the first items of gold, so the, the really lovely sword pyramids. And I was really pleased that that kind of, when I was kind of watching the film, I was like, tick. Yeah, credit where credit's due. And it was also really nice to see that John Jacobs, who was uh, Mrs. Pretty's gardener, he was the one that found the first river. And again, that is reflected in the film. And I think um, uh, some of uh, John Jacobs' family are still around and we're still in touch with them. And I, mm. I really feel for them as well that, you know, it's that kind of, I imagine a real sense of pride as well that, you know, they're, and, and I imagine it must feel so strange to see, you know, your a family member of yours on the kind of the big screen. Yeah, well. fictionalised. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, credit where credit's due. Um, sorry, where were we? We were talking about... The helmet. <laughs> the helmet, that's right, yeah. So over 17 days, 263 objects lifted, so quite fast paced once it got going. Um, and some of the objects, when they came out of kind of, so they'd spent, you know, roughly 1,300 years buried deep beneath the ground uh, in this undisturbed Anglo-Saxon ship burial. And some of the objects came out like, um, 
like they were only buried yesterday. So the, the gold doesn't tarnish. So things like the shoulder clasps, uh, the belt buckle, you know, were just like they were when they were placed in the burial. Wow. But other objects had a bit more of a turbulent history whilst they were buried. So the um, uh, helmet is kind of um, made of kind of iron and copper alloy and other materials. And um, so if you imagine you've kind of got your ship um, and in the middle is kind of like a little kind of chamber with a kind of roof put on it, if you, if you kind of get what I mean, and the earth heaped over that. Now, obviously the weight of the earth over time, water's leaching in as well, caused the burial chamber to collapse. And then some of the objects kind of got crushed, moved. Um, the helmet was one of those objects that just kind of shattered into pieces. Um, and it's hundreds of fragments that make up the helmet and it was kind of the ultimate jigsaw puzzle to put that back together again. So when you um, see photos of the helmet at the British Museum or go and see it when, when you can, um, it's kind of a jute kind of construct, so it's material and then onto it are adhered the fragments of the helmet but it's not a complete um, helmet as such so there's been a lot of years of meticulous research and conservation by our friends at the British Museum mm -hmm. to try and create what they think is the face of the helmet and this is the second time that they've kind of recreated it the first time I think uh, they did it and it kind of stuck out a little bit it left the the neck quite exposed um, so they had another go um, <laughs> as well but yeah so that's why it wasn't a kind of shiny helmet that was lifted <laughs> out it's um, yeah m hundreds of fragments that have been kind of um, reconstructed. Mm, amazing and I'm asking everyone this um, possibly controversial do you think the right decision was made by sending the treasures to the British Museum? Do you think they should have gone to the Ipswich Museum or do you think that now they should return to Sutton Hoo? Mm, that's a good question. We do get asked that quite <laughs> a lot as well. Um, I think I'd have to say um, that I think kind of Mrs Pretty's wishes, so just to kind of give people a bit of backstory, so there was um, a treasure trove inquest uh, in 1939 to determine who was the legal owner of the finds. Was it kind of um, the crown or was it Mrs. Pretty as the landowner and the instigator of the dig? Um, and um, she um, was found to be the legal owner of the gold and silver. Um, that's really what they were looking at uh, in this treasure trove inquest, the gold and silver, but she was the legal owner of all of the treasure. And then in a kind of unparalleled act of generosity, um, and a very magnanimous gesture, she donated all of the finds to the nation uh, at the British Museum so that maximum amount of people could see them and enjoy them. And we have a really lovely, um, two lovely letters in our archive um, that after this kind of had happened in this kind of unparalleled act of um, kindness and uh, um, just so magnanimous, you know, that yeah it's just amazing um uh winston churchill's office kind of wrote to her from uh 10 downing street to offer her a cbe and we have that letter and then we also have the letter that they acknowledge um they send back and say oh we we understand although it's kind of um you know sad about your decision but we understand that you don't want to accept the cbe um, but unfortunately we don't have the letter that she sent to explain why, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we can only hazard a guess that she was everything that we know about Mrs Pretty and she's actually probably one of the characters that's quite hard to get her voice from 1939 because we don't have kind of, for a lot of the other characters we have, kind of diary excerpts, um, interviews they did later on in life mm -hmm. and she's one of the ones that it's always quite hard to kind of pick up her voice so we kind of speculate though, given everything we know about her, there was a very strong sense of duty that ran throughout her life and she probably felt that she was doing the right thing and she didn't want the kind of the fame, the glory that went with it, she just felt that that was kind of her duty. So yeah, it was her wish that it went to the British Museum. I think also, so some, uh, the finds from the previous year's excavation, which is very um, which is covered quite quickly in the um, the film. So there were three mounds that were excavated the previous year. The finds from those uh, excavations went to Ipswich Museum. Um, 
I think, yeah, it, it's such a, an amazing archaeological discovery. And I think given the kind of, I guess, the research and conservation required as well, I think, yeah, the British Museum is the kind of Mrs. Pretty decided the home of the treasures and it's it's really nice we work quite closely with the British Museum as well um, obviously the National Trust only um, acquired the site um, back in about 2000 so relatively quite recently so there wasn't really anything any provision at you know at Mrs. Pretty's time for us to have it on the site but we work pretty closely with the British Museum and we have had objects back on loan uh, from the British Museum. Uh, we have objects on long term loan as well from the British Museum from some of the other graves. And I think that gives the opportunity then for local people to see them without having necessarily to go to London. Um, and there's so much kind of digitally as well um, that's been done now in terms of talks and things. So I think given the kind of the research that's come out about Sutton here and the kind of um, how big a find it is I do think yeah the British Museum is kind of the rightful kind of home in a way and that's what Mrs yeah. Pretty wanted and we have to respect her wishes but it's really nice at the same time to be able to have the opportunities for the objects to come back for local people to see them and the research as well. So I'm joined now by Jay Ducker who was the assistant for Ray Fines on the set of The Dig. So how did you sort of fall into that role? Um, so um, it was back in September of 2019 and a friend of mine um, said there's a post on Facebook from Screen Suffolk and um, you know they're asking for an assistant and I think I mean I was looking at career change anyway but and I, and I was uh, dabbling in film uh, myself so um, I applied um, and but the on the Facebook post I mentioned, should mention was they were looking for an assistant for two months to assist an actor. But the catch was you must have a Suffolk accent or be able to uh, provide some sort of assistance with that anyway. Um, and so I had to send in uh, my kind of my heaviest Suffolk accent <laughs> um, to Screen Suffolk. Um, and then I said, yeah, no, great. Come for an interview. Uh, and then a day before the interview, they said, oh, you're going to be interviewed by Ray Fiennes. Um, oh kind of, yeah, uh, a bit taken back by it, like most people would. I, you know, I was expecting someone of that calibre. Mm -hmm. um, and then so I had to go and meet him um, in Oldborough. And uh, is it the White Lion? Um, I think that's the pub. Um, and I was waiting in the waiting room and I went, I was getting pretty nervous and I was called it was kind of like an underground kind of meeting area. It was kind of weird. Um, there was no lights or anything. And I go in um, and uh, yeah, it's just him. But straight away, he was in his Suffolk accent. Nice. So, and I've said this on kind of countless times now, but it was so disarming for me that I was kind of put straight at ease mm -hmm. Someone trying to, and it wasn't quite perfect. And so for some mad reason i started correcting him from the off and um saying you know oh no you should say it like this or i would say it like this and he, instead of the interview being conducted it kind of changed to him just talking and me kind of you know correcting him and i think he really responded to that because if i'd gone in and go i love all your films yeah grand Budapest hotel and schindler's list and all this i think he would have been gone i don't need anyone like this i need to to help me and so I think uh and for some reason yeah just, just I was probably going to go in and do that to be honest <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah and so then the next day he called me and uh said do you want a do you want the job and he was in his Suffolk accent when he phoned me as well um and he was in Suffolk accent from when I first met him to when we wrapped yeah yeah amazing um true method so what was uh, your actual job were you sort of like did you just get sort of tea for him like what what were you actually doing on set um yeah I mean it, I was his assistant um and I didn't I went into it a bit blind I really didn't know what I've never worked on a, on a feature film like that before I've worked on sets and stuff 
very small, but and around mainly Suffolk, but um, never on that scale. So when I turned up, and um, there's actually a funny story. I kind of I lost his bag on the second day. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please tell um, me that story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, it, well, we were having thieving problems, the whole production, because we were filming in Suffolk, and Suffolk, um, you know, it, it's just it's sparse land, isn't it? It's kind of, uh, it, and it, we had a lot of people, obviously, that didn't know uh, Suffolk too well, and they were out of their comfort zones. That was kind of it, and then I could feel Rafe's nerves with perfecting this accent, because it's one of the hardest accents. Mm. Hard accents get right so um i'm uh, at the time i you know i had headphones and i was really listening to see you know how it was going and whatnot and um they had um all these kind of he, he had like a trailer somewhere and we'd been moved he, we'd moved him from one to another and we'd set him up and i was so kind of focusing on the accent because i honestly thought that was my real job just to make sure he but he had the Charlie Haylock who did just the Suffolk accent and the director calls rap and I go up to him I go oh, that was really good right brother and he goes where's my bag I want to get out and I was like I don't know where'd you leave it last and he's like you don't know where my bag is and I was like um and then luckily the third AD came over and said don't worry Rafe uh Jay's on it we'll go get um we'll send him to go get the bag and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to keep eyes on mm -hmm. every, you know, because his job basically, which I learned is just to, is there nothing else but thinking about the actor. You know, he, you have to take all the trivialities of life out and that's what my job is, but I didn't know that. I thought, you know, but you're working with some of the best actors in the world and I had never worked with any of the best actors in the world. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, suddenly they're all there <laughs> yeah i just realized well, am i oh right okay i get that and then just i mean we got suffolk out of the way and most of it was filmed in guildford um and uh but yeah and then i got into it like a different time but it was i mean it was gruelling it was tough it was mm. really set, it was, yeah it was a lot of rain yeah I can imagine there's a lot of sort of glamour around the idea of a film set but I think once you actually realize that it's hours of setting up lighting and redoing the takes and hundreds and hundreds of times over doing one line one line it's yeah it's incredibly exhausting um to be honest and if you're just sort of poised waiting for one person to and try I, I assume you had to sort of anticipate his needs a bit as well yeah there was I think one day it was kind of halfway through and he kind of, I got into the car with him. Um, he was doing a shot, uh, kind of like a rain scene where he's like running to the man. And it's the last shot of the day. And I spoke to the third AD and it's like, are we near ending? She reckon I'm pretty sure this is the last take. And his stuff was in, in the house. So I run to the house. I go get, because I, I also have to be on set if he needs anything. So I run to the house. I anticipate to go get it. I get his stuff. I got everything ready. I actually fell down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ran out the door. He's like, oh, I think we're all done there, Jay. And I was like, got your bag, got your this, got your that, got the car ready. And he's like, I think you're getting the hang of this now, Jay. And I was like, <laughs> it's stressful, you know, and having to anticipate yeah. everyone's move, everyone's move, because mm. you know, the director, um, not only right so yeah. yeah so i'm asking everyone this so i'll dive straight in with this the the sutton who treasures that are, are currently at the british museum um as of miss edith pretty's sort of will do you think they should be at the british museum do you think they should have gone to the ipswich museum or do you think they should be returned to sutton who uh it's a difficult question mm -hmm. i haven't actually given any much thought to it um my heart instantly said it should probably be at Sutton Hoo. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's not for me to say, but that's <laughs> where my, my heart would say that. Would say yeah, it's a very but, safe answer. <laughs> and I, I would want, the thing is, personally, as a uh, someone who would want to see that, I I would go, um, you know, going to Sutton Hoo, I'd want to see 
the fines, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that would be my answer, but I, I really can't think. Make sure to tune in next week to hear interviews with Screen Suffolk, Charlie Haylock and the second half of our film review. Subscribe on your favourite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. Follow Suffin About Suffolk on YouTube to hear the full-length version of the song and all interviews, plus bonus material. And if you enjoy the podcast, you can head to co-fi.com and show your support for the price of a cup of coffee. All links are in the description. For now, thanks for listening. Mind how you go. A soldier and a sailor went out walking one day. Said the soldier to the sailor, I'd a mind for to pray. And if we have one prayer, may we also have ten. And the whole blooming litany, said the sailor, Amen. Singing cheer a lawyer, a lawyer, a lawyer. Cheer a lawyer, a lawyer, a lawyer. And if we have one prayer, may we also have ten. And the whole blooming litany said the sailor, Amen. Now the first thing we'll pray for, we'll pray for some beer. To keep us all in very good cheer. And if we have one beer, may we also have ten. And the whole blooming brewery said the sailor, Amen. Thank you.